Shushu is one of the greatest experimental pop acts of the past two decades. At its best, singer Jamie Stewart marries some of the most dissonant sounds and cathartic, painful emotions with catchy melodies. It's a big step removed from ska, but as we've shown time and time again, ska connections are everywhere, and Jamie Stewart has them. We discuss his ska roots, his early bands, his interest in reggae and two-tone ska, ties to Asian Man Records and AJJ, and hear incredible stories about his bands. When Knife Play came out, I can't even remember how I got that album, but I was such a huge fan of it. I thought it was Mm -hmm. just like the weirdest thing I'd ever heard. And I I really enjoyed it. And then a few months later, Mia from Asian Man Records uh, found out I needed a roommate and (laughs) and was like, I have a friend, uh, Jamie Stewart. He's in this band Shushu. And I was like, no way. And so Jamie Stewart became our roommate and was our roommate uh, between uh, the A Promise album and Fabulous Muscles. Where were you guys living? We were living in the AK Press Warehouse on 23rd in Oakland between San Pablo and uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Way. And that warehouse caught fire a few years ago and they renovated it, it changed hands a couple times. And now it's super expensive live workspaces in the middle of a tent city. All right. So, okay. This is Scott podcast. So I want to hear the story about the, the cover for a promise. You went to Vietnam. Part I'm interested in is you um, had said before in interviews that you funded this Vietnam trip by recording a bunch of ska and punk bands in your neighborhood. And terrible third wave ska bands. <laughs> I mean, I hope none of those kids are listening now. They'd all be adults, so they probably don't care. They can take it. It's fine. It was all like, you know, kids who were like 15 and, you know, in their first bands and, and things like that. I mean, with, with occasional like, exceptions of, you know, bands that had recorded a little bit more, but largely it was high school kids who were fucking around and didn't know what they were doing particularly. Um, so yeah, it was, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how my roommates tolerated it. <laughs> so just great, great sounding horn sections. What you a lot. Yeah. A lot of out of tune horn sections, a lot of singing, <laughs> a lot of super incredibly highly tuned piccolo snares. <laughs> <laughs> every all, every every conceivable rotten trope you would expect a lot of mesa like small mesa boogie practice amps um <laughs> this the san jose guitar center fully funded all of all of these bands which then fully funded this uh life-altering trip that i took can we name any names do you remember any of the band names uh it would i would it would be cool if i could um I mean, of those like little, of those, of those like kid bands, I can't really remember any. Um, but you know, but I did. I don't. Do you guys remember that band, Fear May? Yeah. I mean, they they were like a real band at the time. I recorded them a little bit. I don't know if anything turned into the recordings that we did. Their horn section ended up on the first Shushu record. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was yeah Christian, the one of the singer and guitar player. We were roommates, and I was and uh, so I was friends with those guys. Yeah, their horn their horn section played on a night play which was the first Shushi record and they did a good job. They were, they were, they were a real band. I can't really remember anybody else. I mean, it was sort of like a, like a eighth month blur of just doing this all the time. So how often, like how many bands a week? Oh, uh, it was, it was always on the weekend. It was always like set up on Friday night, play like their whatever songs on Saturday and then do like a quick mix on Sunday. Gotcha. But it was, it was like, it was three or four times a month for, um, for several months. Gotcha. I didn't really get any better as an engineer either. Like, I, I mean, it was as shitty for them as it was for me. Like it was the first time I had really done this kind of stuff. I'm sure, I'm sure I did a bad job and was not in a good mood. It could, I don't know. I, I think I was just trying to like take advantage of them basically. <laughs> so I could get the fuck out of Dodge. I mean, I wasn't trying to do a bad job, but I knew, I mean, I knew that I was really just sort of, I mean, I was trying my best, but my best at the time was, that was a fairly low bar. So sorry, teenagers from the year 2000 in the South Bay. I accept, I, it was all my fault. 
The only one I'm aware of is because there's a friend. His name's Jason Tin. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What band was he in that I, I remember hanging out with him? He was in Short Round, but he also eventually played in uh, uh, Chinkies, Mike Park's band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, God, I don't remember recording him. I mean, I, I know who he is. He's a really, he's a cool guy, and he was a good player. Oh, uh, you did his, because uh, I, I was looking it up, you did his first EP, so Short Round. So I, I think the band developed a little better after that. Okay. But yeah, yeah, he he told us about it and was not not particularly proud of that recording <laughs> session, but Oh no, I, I always remember him him being good. Okay. I, I mean I probably don't remember it because it was good. So I just I didn't file it away in like the, <laughs> the shit pile of what this memory generally is. Why was it you wanted to go specifically to Vietnam? It's it's sort of silly. I had I had seen this movie called Three Seasons. I didn't have a I mean, I had a pretty shitty life at the time. I really didn't have any like my band, none of the bands I was playing in were going anywhere. I lived in a terrible house. My job was rough. My family was a complete and total disaster. I was broke. I didn't have any kind of healthy relationships at all. Um, so I just, I got, I was very, got overly attached to things like movies and books, which I think a lot of people do who have shitty lives. Anyway, I saw this movie. It looked like another world. And at the time, I mean, this was, uh, like the year 2000, I can't remember when I went, I went mean, 2001, but this was around the year in, in 2000. So it was, it was, I mean, now tourism to Vietnam is pretty common, but at the time they had just maybe a year before started allowing um, Americans to come, you know, visit as tourists. So it was, it was a much more sort of uh, rarefied uh excursion you know than it would be now i mean it's still a rarefied thing to do now and, and a, a privileged thing to be able to do now but it, it wasn't something that that people commonly did at the time uh, and i you know i mean i was just i was just i needed very very much to get as far away as possible from anything that had to do with my existence and this movie made vietnam seem like an extraordinarily beautiful place which it indeed is um so it was largely based on that that single overly romantic notion i didn't really know anything about it aside from <laughs> reading you know, the Lonely Planet guidebook on my break at work. Do you want to tell the story so so we can people can understand what Ska funded for you? <laughs> <laughs> the story of the album cover? Uh, it, it's, it funded this trip, uh, which, you know, was it was the first trip I ever took by myself. Um, so it, in addition to this particular album cover, um, it, you know, it, it, <laughs> it was, it was a, little, a little more to me than just this record cover. Although I'm... <laughs> This record cover was important to the band that I planned. So anyway, so uh, it was the, the, so I was on this trip. It was towards the end of the trip. I had spent maybe 10 days in Hanoi. Um, and I think of all the places that I went to Vietnam, I think I liked it there the most. So I spent the most time there. And I had read in this aforementioned Lonely Planet guidebook that there was um, like a gay cruising lake. And I thought, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. And on the trip, um, to kind of keep from being lonely, I, I took this like rubber baby doll and I would just like put it in places and take photos of it, you know, like on a beautiful mountain or whatever, or, like on a lake, or if I, you know, there was a landmine on the side of the road, I put up a landmine on the side of the road, a picture of the rubber baby with it. And so it was partially to give me something to do so I wouldn't be so lonely uh, and to just genuinely have an art project. And then also, I mean, I had no idea what the country was like, which in fact, people are extraordinarily friendly and nice, but you know, I didn't know what it would be like. So I figured if I seemed slightly insane, people would be less likely to give me a hard time, but it was that part of it was unnecessary. Um, so anyway, so uh, I, I immediately get picked up uh, like within seconds um, of uh, walking around this lake, um, this, uh, young guy and he asked me if I want to talk, he asked me if I wanted to get a beer and we hung out and we had a couple beers. And then he said, well, so are we going back to your hotel? And I said, he looked, I, this was like, you know, a little bit closer to, I mean, AIDS is obviously still a major problem now, but at the time, you know, this was more than 20 years ago. So, you know, it was a much, much, much more serious health risk than it is now, although it of course still remains a serious health risk. And I didn't want to have sex with a, a hustler in a developing country. I also, you know, I didn't, I have no idea, like, am I going to go to, you know, is this like a sting operation? Am I going to go to jail, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a developing country? So I just said, okay, well, what about if we go back to my hotel and I take some photos 
uh, holding this rubber baby because I had it in my backpack all the time. <laughs> and he just looked at me like, okay, like somebody asked him to do shit like this like 50 times a day, um, <laughs> which might have, I mean, it's very possible that people did in fact ask him to do shit like this 50 times a day. Uh, so we go back to my hotel and once, this was at night when we met and in the hotel room, it was a, a more light, obviously. And I could see that it was a, he was seemed to be living kind of a rough life. His clothes were pretty dirty. He had a lot of like scars and he asked me if he could use a shower. So I, I said, yeah, of course. And he took a shower and then immediately put his clothes back on and then said, okay, let's do the photos. And I handed him the baby and he just started immediately doing like kind of posing with it. He seemed pretty natural. It, it, it didn't, I mean, I have no idea if it made him uncomfortable. I hope it didn't, but he didn't, it didn't seem like it was. And then he just like, just gradually started, you know, he took off his shirt then took a baby photo, took off his pants, baby photo, took off his underwear, baby photo. Um, and they were, they were, and then he, and then I, and then he was initially doing kind of like sexualized poses. And I said, okay, well maybe just do some things where you just sit like really woodenly. And, and, and I took a few shots like that. And then, uh, he, you know, he asked me for a certain amount of money and I gave him that and then a big tip. And then, um, uh, then he said, okay, well, I'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, no. <laughs> but fortunately, he didn't come back. I mean, I had no idea what that would mean. But I didn't want to say, oh, <laughs> no, no, thanks, pal. I mean, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I mean, the whole situation, it didn't feel that, it's, it went by very quickly and it felt very strange. It didn't at any point feel dangerous or tense in any way. I hope that did not for him. But it certainly was an odd experience. Um, and even when it ended immediately, I had, process that it was an odd experience and I wasn't sure if I wanted to have it again. Uh, and then he's, you know, then he split and then I finished my vacation, went home a couple days later. Uh, so I developed this set of pictures and these, the ones that I took of this gentleman um, were uh, quite, they were to me pretty striking. Uh, and I had them for a couple years and didn't really, I didn't really do anything with them. And then uh, the, Shushu is the band that I play in, and then we were getting ready to do our second record and uh, needed a record cover, and I uh, pulled this photo out, and um, the friend of ours who was helping design it, Kurt Stumbaugh, he did the layout, and then we, we sent it to our label at the time, 5RC, and they and, it, and in, in, the, in the original photo, you could see the, the gentleman's name was Hang. You could see his, uh, his uh, cock. And they said, okay, well, we can have the cock on the front, but almost no record stores will carry it. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I mean, the point is not his cock. The point is sort of his strange sort of vulnerable slash not vulnerable, weird photo holding the baby. So I was, I was a big Todd Solon's fan at the time. And he had this movie called Storytelling. And there, there was a, to keep from his, to keep from the movie Storytelling being rated X, he put a big orange rectangle over a particular scene and I thought, okay, in an homage to Todd Solons, we'll put a orange rectangle over Hang's uh, penis. I, I just said that I was like driving home from my horrible job and talking to the designer at or the layout person at a uh, 5RC, and and uh, she said it, and then sent sent me um, sent me some proofs and and such and and there it is, and there it is anyway. <laughs> That's the story. I remember in, in one of the outtakes from that photo set. Uh, I mean, I think he had a okay time because in one of them he's like winking like really like like funnily and and giving like a big thumbs up <laughs> yeah i mean it's some in some of them he's 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 doing some kind of funny poses um it didn't seem like he was having a bad time but i mean i don't know what it's like to, to have been a sex worker in the year 2000 and hanoi so I mean, maybe he was just trying to get to the day or maybe he did have a good time i hope he did <laughs> I remember when you told me the story initially that you you gave him the money and you gave him a big tip and then he looked at the money and then he looked back at you and asked for more money. <laughs> he was like, can I just get a little bit more like real hustler mentality? That's not impossible. Uh, I mean, <laughs> if, if the money was there, then I mean, if I was him, I would have done the same thing. That's that seems I don't remember that specifically, but that seems very possible. <laughs> so my first experience with shoe shoot. Now, I, I've been I saw Ibopa in the 90s several times and I had the Ibopa record, but I was in Streetlight Records. Oh, yeah, I, I used to work there. Yeah, so that that's where I'm going with this. I was in Streetlight Records when Fabulous Muscles came out and uh it was on the staff recommended thing and I and I picked it up. I was like, "What is this?" And I asked someone they're like, "Oh, that's Jamie. That's Jamie Stewart from a uh, former employee of, of Streetlight Records." Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's cool. That was nice of them. 
I got it and I had made no connection for a while that it was uh, Jamie Stewart from Ibopa, but it was always Jamie Stewart from Streetlight. <laughs> what sold it to me? <laughs> when did you work at Streetlight? I worked there twice um, or for two, two periods of time in the really late 90s, mm-hmm. maybe 1999. So was it, it was during Ibopa then? Yeah, during Ibopa, and then the band I was in after that was Ten on the Swear Jar, and maybe for part of that, but I can't really remember. In both periods, I didn't work there for very long. It was like both periods was for less than a year. Um, but the staff was great. I I, um, I learned a lot, as one would expect, a lot about music when I worked there. It was it mm-hmm. was a, it was a it was a kind of a transition period for me where I, I had been working as a preschool teacher, and then and working as a social worker on and off. Um, and uh, I kind of did those in between working this record store also and I was kind of transitioning between that line of work and becoming sort of obsessively dedicated to music. And it was a, a, kind of during that time and it was uh, it, it, uh, it, it really helped me kind of knuckle down and become a lot more serious about music. So, OK, Adam and I both saw you play um, in 2021. You were on tour with AJJ. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. at which at which uh, which show? A great American music hall. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yeah, it was it was awesome. I hadn't seen you in a while. There's. I want to ask about one particular moment that I loved. I think Adam will agree was incredible. We talked about it during the Andrew Jackson or the AJJ episode. You did a uh, a balloon solo. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> we're reprising the balloon for. We have a tour coming up as as an introduction to a song. Um, so. The balloon is coming back. How did you <laughs> land on on the balloon solo, and and what's what's your intent behind it? Um, I just, I mean, I'm as one of a big. This is going to make me sound like a nerdy dick. <laughs> no, go for it. <laughs> you know, a part of you know a, 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 a big part of the shushu aesthetic and practice is always looking for sounds we haven't used before. And you know, or recontextualizing sounds, you know, just it just comes from the tradition of music concrete and um, and you know, kind of nineteen fifties experimental music. Um, and uh, you know, when you're a kid, you blow in the balloon, you whistle, it makes the horrible sound. Um, and I, on the record, the last record we had in two thousand twenty one, oh no, there's there's a bridge in one of the songs that's I think like five or six tracks of just that kind of balloon screech for maybe twenty seconds. Um, and I remember in the song, it seemed to be an interesting sound. I was curious about using it live. Um, there, I mean, there's on in any kind of sound, there's, there's, there's not really like a conscious theory behind it other than, okay, this is, this sounds unusual. What will happen if we do this or what could it turn into? Or, uh, it like at this moment, it doesn't necessarily have any meaning, but by doing it repeatedly, will it develop some kind of meaning? I mean, it's also just like, a, it's a, it's a pretty unpleasant sound yeah. <laughs> and, you know i mean i i mean I, I have a lot of problems with my voice so i have to the vocals crank super loud so i don't have to strain so much so i mean it's you know then like squeezing this screeching balloon into a microphone that's cranked much much louder than vocals that normally crank it's you know it's a it's i don't know just i just i was curious as to what would happen or what it would what it could mean it's especially jarring because you're you're playing a solo set and everything's mixed really quiet so you're not you're not like backed by drums or loud electric guitars. It's it's quiet music, and then the balloon comes in and it's so loud. I I think just I mean just extreme dynamics in music generally are interesting to me. Um, when we play a band set, you know we we try to we try to do that as well. I mean it's a lot harder when you're playing with drums to have it be as incredibly as you know as an incredibly wide a dynamic range as doing just like little folky guitar stuff and then with a sort of a screechy post-industrial sound um uh but you know it, it just just another dynamics experiment also it's kind of in the same line as the the thing i've seen you do with the whistle yeah 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 a very a very a very similar thing yeah yeah which that'll that'll clear your sinuses out <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been times where we had like all four band members like blowing like track whistles at the same time oh my god it can be an uncool thing to do. <laughs> you appeared on uh, AJJ's record, Christmas Island. Yeah, yes. I sang, uh, uh, God, I feel like a jerk. I can't remember if they mixed it as a duet or backup singing. But uh, a real good friend of mine, John Conkleton, was uh, producing it and just uh, called me and asked me 
like they were in the studio at that moment and he said, Hey, can you do vocals for this right now? And I actually was in the middle of doing some other vocal takes for a record we were working on. So everything was set up. So the, the timing was good. I read in this article, um, from like 2016 or 17 that said that you and, uh, Sean were like working on a project together. Oh yeah. We, we gave it, we gave it, a, we gave it a shot. Um, I, I, we had, we had tried to write some, some songs together and um, at the time that we were doing it, we we did we did it at one time and our schedules weren't working out. And we tried it again, and it was at a point where we were uh, we had a record come out yesterday that's like a very almost like an entirely experimental record with mm-hmm. particularly grim lyrics. And it was in the middle of when we were working on that record. And Sean is a very accomplished like verse chorus kind of songwriter um and i my mind was like entirely in the opposite end of the musical spectrum at the time and i I just (laughs) really wasn't able to connect to that world um not having anything to do with what he was he was presenting excellent material i just i don't just wasn't in that mode so we kind of put that to bed but then we had the idea of him doing a solo record uh with me producing it and uh, we worked on that for a while and that seems to be kind of in a little bit of a hiatus, but we were just talking about it yesterday again too. So hopefully that cranks up again. Someday we will do something together. And we did actually do five songs for this uh, solo record of his. Um, So hopefully that turns into something um, more complete. Cool. All right. So let's, let's go, let's dig back a little bit into your early, earliest experience with ska and reggae. I know you, uh, you listen to the music on uh, KPFK on Sundays. Is that where you discovered the music? Oh, you, you, yeah, you did some homework. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, um, so uh, I was, I think it was like the summer going into high school. So right out of junior high. And I was just pretty much listening to Top 40 at the time. But something in me knew that there was more music in the world somewhere. Um, I just didn't really know where, where to find it or what it would be. My dad had given me a Talking Heads record when I was in seventh grade. So, I mean, I could put together, okay, this is definitely really, uh, you know, incredibly well done music, but it's really different than, um, you know, like Duran Duran or something like that, or, you know, whatever stuff that was on like Power 106. Um, So I just, I just like sat at the radio and just like, turn the dial really slowly thinking it would unlock some secret if I turned it slow enough. And in fact it did like on, on Sundays they had a, they had a, uh, uh, a reggae dub and ska show. And I had, I had never heard anything like that before and was immediately like, I don't know what this is. Oh, okay. Here it is. I found it. This is the treasure. Um, and it was, it was, you know, it was the first music outside of top 40 that I got, you know, independent of you know, my dad is a musician. So he turned me on to some stuff, but you know, independent of my, uh, my dad or my dad's friends or or any friends of mine uh, uh, exposing me to. And um, I mean, I've been a, a huge fan since it's, uh, I mean, I particularly, I played bass uh, or played bass for a long time before I sang it. That, that style of bass playing like, remains a really incredibly big influence on my playing. And I played in a dub band for a little while. And mm-hmm. Was that a uh, Rashi Majesta and the Crush Crew? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they were, they were really good. Huge pricks incredibly like <laughs> dick like all those guys were such assholes like uh but they were very 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 good musicians they eventually kicked me out of the band for being queer those that's that they, they, were, they were those kind of cats uh but they were they were badass musicians um but yeah yeah still deep deeply influenced and interested in uh ska and reggae and dub and um all, all those kind of sounds of uh that like remained a, a big part of uh, of every band that I've ever been in, one way or another. And so your your second show you ever saw was Pato Bantan and uh, Tipa. You really Irie. did your homework. <laughs> wow, yeah, Pato, on, Pato Bantan and Tipa Iri at uh, at CSUN. That's it's interesting because Pato ba- I love Pato Bantan, but yeah, that's it seems kind of out of left field to me as a second show ever. I mean, I just it was you know there was a reggae show that I could walk to from my house. I mean, I just saw like a flyer for it. So, I mean, I didn't know who he was. I just saw it was this reggae show. It was yeah, it was just like red, gold, and green, you know. And they had like the right graphics or whatever. I mean, the I mean, the first show I ever went to was David Bowie and Susie and the Banshees, 
And I kind of, I sort of dressed like I was going to a Susie and the Banshee show, but I had like, I had like a tam on. I was like such an asshole. That was like my style in high school, basically, was like I would wear like, you know, like two tone, like shark skin suits, but I had like Robert Smith hair, you know? It was, it was, it was a very un, uh, uncongealed look. <laughs> so, uh, what do you remember about the Pato Bantan show? Uh, I remember that Tobiary and Pato Bantan had the same band and they just came out and sang. Um, they had, I mean, now it's, it's the, it's the kind of show that we would play now in like a weird community center part of, of a, you know, of like a state college or something. <laughs> um, but they had like little, little, like a weird collection of like little risers for the band. Like each, each band member had like their own little platform or something. I mean, they must have taken it from like a theater department or something. Now that I think about it, I remember they were both really, really good. They had a white, like a local white reggae band on first. And I remember thinking uh, like even, I mean, I was really young, like even thinking, even then I was like, this is not what I came for. (laughs) <laughs> and then and then those guys came out who were the real deal and i was like oh here it is okay so it was like oh so even <laughs> if the clothes are right and they say it's reggae not necessarily good and, you know just sort of beginning to understand that music you know some music is good and some music is bad yeah so that was a big lesson for me um i don't know i i, I remember thinking it was really good and being very excited by the whole thing I wore my tan to Catholic school the next day and got a dress code violation. <laughs> I mean, but like no, no fucking like skinny white middle class kid from the Valley should wear a tan ever anyway. So I'm glad I got a dress code violation. <laughs> you, uh, you, you also a fan of uh, two tone. When did you discover two tone ska? Uh, after, after reggae, um, uh, I mean, just like all like the really obvious classics, like you know, specials and selector and and uh, madness and stuff like that. Um, I didn't. I was never a really big record collector, uh, but you know, I I got in, I got really deep into those bands, or like you know, I like those bands as much as as I like the Cure and this Mortal Coil and uh, you know, Cocktail Twins and bands like that at the same time and Bauhaus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's all from the same era. And yeah, 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 totally. It's not actually as different as people like to think, in a way. I mean, you know, I mean, it's an. I mean, I'm sure you guys know this, but you know, I mean, all like the the punk guys and the, the reggae guys in England, you know, when you know in the '70s, all those guys hung out and played at each other's clubs and you know DJ together and things like that. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, those those worlds aren't are not all that far apart. Mm-hmm. I mean, just like you know, just like de- all of them are dealing with the shittiness of England in the early eighties, yep. you know, in, 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 in any, <laughs> any way they can. Yeah, and they're all being influenced by uh, reggae and ska in, in some fashion or another. You're so before before you move up to because uh, you're you're down in Southern California, right? At this point, yeah, yeah, I, I grew up in Los Angeles, yeah, in the suburbs in the valley. Before you moved down there, um, you had a a. Uh, a parody band called Lime Green Leisure Suits. Oh my God. I'll say it for the third time. You really <laughs> did your homework. Yes. This was my first band. Okay. What, what can you give us a picture of some of the parodies you did? Uh, I mean, we did like weird Al Yankovic style parodies where we would take largely, we wrote a couple of our own songs, but they were still like joke songs. We did, um, you know, like t- taking a melody of, of some song and changing the words. Do you remember any of the songs, the originals that you took and how you changed them? Yeah. Uh, we did the grand fart by sticks. The grand illusion was the original. <laughs> uh, I still weirdly remember the words to that one. we got to hear it. Welcome to the grand fart. Come on in and smell what's happening. Pay the price. Get a gas mask for the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the stage is set, the band starts farting Suddenly your heart stops pounding Wishing secretly you were not here Amazing Anyway, very classy Nice um, We did We might have done something with the James Brown song Living in America But we, a lot of the songs I can't I, I, they kind of, I would kill or die to have one of the tapes that we made Because we did a very 
yet again, another uncool thing where we would, a lot of the, I went to a really tiny uh, junior high with like one uh, class for each grade. And we would just, we wrote me and my friend, Brad Jameson and Scott. Oh, I can't remember his last name. Uh, beginning with an M we, we would, we would basically make up parody songs about other kids in the class <laughs> and record them. But then we would make the tapes and then we would sell the tapes to everybody in the class. And then they would like buy it and then realize it was a very, you know, unkind parody song about them. So by the end of <laughs> the eighth grade, we were extraordinarily unpopular. Nobody would talk to us. Um, and you know, we deserved it. Some kids like, what's this song called Rick here? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I, I wish I could remember more of that stuff. You know, the grand fart though. I, you know, at least I remember the grand fart. <laughs> if it is the best song I ever wrote, I, I'm cool. I quit music right now. So imagine, okay. Imagine you're doing a solo shoo shoo show. And then where you would do a balloon solo, you just stand up and do the grand fart. That is not a terrible idea. But do you guys do you guys know who Scott Walker is? Yes. So I had had this. I had the idea. Of, you know, you like in in an, in an eternal quest to try and find some new sound. You know, you like make the fart sound by like blowing yeah. into your arm or something, right? Mm-hmm. I had the idea of doing this in a song and then I get the new Scott Walker record, Bish Bosh, and that motherfucker already <laughs> did it on the record. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not so bad because he's one of my all-time idols and I have stolen many of his ideas, but I figured that idea was so specific I couldn't really steal that one. Um, but anyway, so it, it's kind of already been done. The, Scott Walker, is, may he rest in, in peace, has already kind of done the grand fart. What was the band you were playing in when, when the Gigi Allen thing happened? Oh, that was called uh, <laughs> such a bad name, the Live Nude Psychics. <laughs> um, and actually, the drummer from that band, um, who I, I was a, a teenager when I played in that band, it was they were all like older, like legit new wave celebrities. And somehow, when I was a, a teenager, I was in this band. But the drummer from that band uh, is now in uh, in Shushu, which is exciting for me because he's a super badass drummer. Nice. But anyway, the, so the, the live new psychic arcs is, is pretty long. Yeah. Do you want to hear this G.G. Allen story? Um, just briefly. So, yeah, it's, it's a great story. Oh, we don't, I, I don't have to tell it. Anyway, very, very quickly, we were playing a show in Los Angeles, Tiny Punk Club. G.G. Allen is in the audience. He jumps up on stage, looks at us, and we're afraid he's going to murder us. And he just, and he just goes, play a blues. And then we just sort of play a blues. He does his G.G. Allen thing. And then we can see from the back of the club, slowly the security guards kind of snaking through the audience. And then they had like a rug and then they just like jumped on stage and wrapped him in this rug and like very quickly got him out the door. It it was incredible. They must've rehearsed the move a lot. Anyway. So there was, I got to play with, I was forced to play with Gigi Allen. Love it. And you were forced to play blues. No, I was forced to play a blues. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So you, so you, you, you go up to San Jose and, uh, you uh, you start a band called the Indestructible Beat of Palo Alto. Yeah, that was that was the first band that I sang in, really, other than the Lime Green Leisure Suits. Now, I was I was reading an old article that happened at the time. It sounds like there was some debate in the band about if it should be the Indestructible Beat or the Indestructible Beat of Palo Alto. Oh yeah, I I think I don't know. No one in that band was cool, and I think we were, <laughs> everybody was just like trying to think of the least dorky name possible. It was, it was, there was, I got, I got this record called the Indestructible Beat of Soweto, which was like an early township jive, like South African township jive record, which I really, really loved. So it was just like a, a play on the name of that record. Yeah. I mean, you know, Palo Alto could not be anything any more different than Soweto. So. I mean, you're doing, it was, it was to be ironic, right? It was funny. It wasn't really, I wasn't trying to be ironic. I guess it was, I think it was more to be, I thought it was funny than necessarily ironic. I mean, I wasn't, in no way was I trying to imply that Palo Alto had some like inherent groove or that there was any sort of real comparison. I don't know. I was a kid. I don't know what I was thinking. I probably just, it was a, it was sort of a joke, but not a joke or I don't know. It was a long time ago. I don't totally remember. And then Ibopa played with a whole lot of ska bands. Yeah. I think it was just like, that was kind of what was really going on. This was in the mid nineties 
in the Bay Area, um, in the South Bay, that weather wasn't really happening so much in San Francisco. Um, I mean, that was the scene. And I Boba had horns and we liked ska, but we were, I mean, we also had a ton of other, in no way was I Boba a ska band, but I Boba was influenced by ska along with a bunch of other stuff. Right. So, I mean, a lot of times we were like the first on the bill at the Cactus Club when like Goldfinger or Aquabats or something was playing, you know, I mean, we, you know, there'd be like four us and then like two ska bands and then, you know, the headliner. So, um, it was, it was, it was mostly that, that kind of situation. Just briefly, can you describe the Cactus Club for people who haven't been there? <laughs> Cause I know you love that place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, let's see. The upside of the Cactus Club was that you could play there, but I mean, that's like saying the upside of the Golden Corral is that you can eat there. I mean, <laughs> it's like, it was the worst possible place that you could play. And the people who ran it were not nice. And I don't know. I mean, it was the first time that I ever played for more than like three people, you know, or something. So, I mean, there was that. I don't know. It was, a, it was, a, it was not, it was not. It was not a particularly cool environment. That said, we played there all the time because yeah. they would let us play there. Great bathrooms. Yeah. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah, that was a that was the, they were nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. It's I it, I am. It's thoroughly gone now, right? I oh yeah. Imagine. It's all yeah. Gone. Yeah. Okay. Fuck them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I I would imagine you cats played there a million times, also. Oh yeah. <laughs> Not usually the best shows, you know, but like you said, if you're just trying to fill in dates. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah. Uh, I remember because um, we're, we're from Gilroy, so that would be the, you know, San Jose and Santa Cruz were the closest places you could get to to play. And uh, I remember just having these uh, conversations with uh, Calvin, the booker. <laughs> that motherfucker. Yeah. How many people are you guys going to draw? You know, be like, oh, we'll bring some people. And then we bring some people. And then he'd always under, he'd be like, oh, I, I saw like five people when you guys played. I was like, no way. There was like 40 people. And then you yeah. have to like argue about how many people you actually drew. Oh, forever. Yeah. Or frequently, not every time, but at least half of the time he would say, all right, I'll pay you guys 200 bucks. And for us at the time, we were like, fuck, 200 bucks. Wow. We, um, you know, and then we'd show up and he'd be like, I never said that. And we'd like, you know, or he'd like, just like put, like he would just, we'd be like, okay, can we please get our $200, sir? And he would just like, <laughs> he would just like put like $30 in a pile of quarters on the bar and walk away or, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of shit like that. Um, or there were, <laughs> there was one time where they had asked us to headline on a Saturday. He just called me up. He said, Hey, can you guys headline? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Just let me know when. He's like, okay, hung it. But he never told us when. <laughs> and then we had another show. And then our, the, one of the trumpet player was looking in the paper. He's like, we're supposed to play at the Cactus Club tonight. I'm like, what are you talking about? We had some other show on Saratoga or something. And he's like, yeah, it has this headline. He's like, I don't know anything about this. <laughs> and we ended, I don't know, we ended up going. And there was like literally zero people in the whole club, which then for a Saturday was probably no good. Yeah. And part of me felt very, very stupid. There was zero people there. And then part of me was like, fuck you, ass. <laughs> Probably lost a ton of money on staff tonight. Anyway, no reason to be bitter now. It was a long time ago. So Iboba got signed to uh, Sponge Bath, which was a subsidiary of Electra. Yeah, sort of. That, that didn't last because the, la the subsidiary kind of dropped everybody pretty much. Yeah, 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 yeah. What was, how did that all come about? It was, it was a fairly organic thing. I mean, we were playing as much as we could possibly play and, you know, sending demo tapes to everybody on earth. And I didn't really know about uh, like, like the uh, indie labels at the time or underground labels. Um, I mean, like I had mentioned, you know, my, my, as I said, my dad was in the music business, but he was in like very much the major label music business. So that was the only reference I really had for it. Um, so God, I don't even totally remember. We must have sent him a demo tape or something. And then I, he, the guy, I can't remember his name, but the A&R guy came and saw us play at the fishbowl. You remember? Oh yeah. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and then and then asked us, but I mean, it, it was there was there was like a two month period or something where it seemed like this was going to happen, and then it folded. It wasn't like we did some real recording for them or something. It was sort of like, oh, the dream has finally occurred, and then it remained a fuzzy dream. Or so, I mean, it's it's debatable to say whether or not we were actually ever signed to them because it folded so quickly. And so, you, and your dad was also in Ibopa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For at the beginning of the band, he was, and he helped us do recording and stuff. And I had he, I had kind of a shit childhood, and I mean, he was insane, and had a lot of uh, psychological and, and drug problems. So for most of my childhood, he wasn't really around. Um, but then he had a couple periods where he really got his act together, and that was when I started getting more serious about music. And I, as, I, as in in an attempt to kind of a help me learn more about music, and then also kind of try and develop our relationship more. Um, he, he played in that band at, in the very beginning and really kind of helped us uh, kind of get rolling and like showed me how to do the really, like really basics of recording and things like that. It was, he, he was a motherfucking great musician. It was, it was really cool to play with him. I saw his name listed uh, as fuck machine. Oh yeah. We all had uh Oh no, that was Michael. There was another Michael in the band later. Oh, that was, that was a different, okay. It was a different. A different yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't, I think my dad had a nickname. I think he was in the band before we all had nicknames. Mm. Or if he did, I can't remember what it was. <laughs> that was such a 90s thing to do. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> None of us are our names. We're just wacky names. Yeah, every, yeah everyone. In the, yeah, I was I was purring Mantis was my stupid ass <laughs> nickname. We had a trombone player named Spacecock who really did not like being called Spacecock. Well, he would refer to himself as Space Cube. But no one uh, and no one else went along with it. <laughs> was the major label uh, issue? Was that what killed the band? I, I mean, kind of. I think I decided. Like I was at at that point. I think I was getting more interested in a slightly more far out music, and there was also just getting more serious about music generally. And probably half the people in the band were very serious about music, and half the people in the band. Uh, we're doing it for a hobby. Um, and it, it, it was getting to be pretty clear that the amount of time that it actually took to be in a real band was a lot more than, than they could or, or would give. Um, and, you know, and just, you know, it was a, the, there was like seven people in the band it, you know, it's hard to, for seven people to get along. So there was just a couple of people we weren't really getting along with. Um, so five people in the, that band went on to, uh, I think we just wanted to basically kick these other people out and start something that <laughs> was just was the vibe. The vibe was much was uh, just uh, just aesthetically different. And then uh, those people went on to do uh, Ten on the Square Jar, which was after I Boba. But I, I think we just sort of used the label thing not working out as kind of an excuse. I think. I mean, it was a long time ago, so I don't totally remember. But I think that was the case. There was different people that I think in Ten in the Square Jar, but. Uh... At one point, you had Mia, right? Mia, who worked at Asian Man Records and played in the Mugs. Oh yeah, she was. She she played. She for like a she sang on a record on Tennis Forge record, but was never really in the band. Okay. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's it. And she was she did she did a record cover for Shushu, which was the band after Tennis Forge. And then I played in a in a totally different band with her called. Uh, um. Seven Year Rabbit Cycle with a bunch of other people. Wow. I saw Seven Year Rabbit Cycle at a in a at a bar in the Tenderloin. Oh really? <laughs> oh well. Oh, that would have been a chemos probably. Yeah, and chess chess was playing drums, and and the symbols were, the symbols were like seven feet in the air. Symbols very high. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he still, I think he still does that. Yeah. Was she your connection to Asian Man? Because uh, I. Ten, 10 in the Swear Jar, you had a few records, and then there was sort of like a, uh, when Shushu was going, like a, a sort of like a... A retrospective, yeah. Yeah, that Asian man. Yeah, I, I think, I, I, I don't think she, she did the uh, the album cover for it, but I think it was Mike Parker just asked if we wanted to do it. So 10 in the Swear Jar was, was just around for not even a year, and we just had like, we had two EPs, and then an unreleased EP, and then somebody had just like, done a live recording off the board or something like that. So um, it was a very short lived thing. Did you know Mike then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, we were never, we were never like really close friends, but I always really liked him. He, he was always real sweet to me. Mm. Did he, uh, did he come, did he support Ibopa or did, when did you kind of get to know him? 
I think it might have just been just because, you know, it's a, a small scene. Uh, it might have been just from around. And then me and I have been friends since we were teenagers. Um, and probably just because she started working there, I got to know Mike a little bit better. Oh. Did you ever visit Asian Man Records? Oh, yeah, many times. <laughs> oh, yeah? What was that like? It was it was cool. I mean, it was just it was interesting to see. I mean, at the in the I I kind of haven't really kept tabs on how this is sort of the sort of post height of Scott trajectory was, but all that stuff's kind of coming back around again or coming back around again, coming back around again. Jesus. Um, so hopefully <laughs> it's affecting him positive positively. Um, but I was I was in, I was interested. I was kind of amazed to see what to me felt like a really vibrant and big label was operating out of like a desk in a garage. Um, it was kind of like a wake up call for me as to what, you know, being a label was actually like, uh, but you know, it was, it was nice. He, he was always, he was, he's always, has always been incredibly warm and, and sweet. I think everybody feels that way about him because it's true. Where does the formation of Shushu uh, lie with the Vietnam trip we started out with? Did Shushu happen after that trip? Yeah, yeah, that was that was after. Yeah, a couple years after. No, oh, okay. uh, no, it was right before. Shit, I can't totally remember. the The record, a promise that that album cover is on, is the second Shushu record. I can't remember if I was, if I was. I think Shushu had just started when I took that trip. And so, now I, I had read that. Um, the first time you wrote a Shushu song is you went out alone to a dance club in San Jose on Christmas, failed to pick somebody up, and then came home and like basically wrote a dance song, which became your first Shushu song. Yeah, yeah, that is correct. Okay, do you do you remember what song that was? Oh, uh, it's called oh, it's called uh, Gen- it's called Jennifer Lopez. Okay, and that's it's on uh, an EP we did uh, that came out in two thousand two called Chapel of the Chimes. But there was there was a couple versions of it, and I think the one that's on um, that EP, I think, might have been the second or third version of it. Now, did you know this was a new band at that point, or did it take a little while before you were like, okay, I think I got something here, a new direction? I think I I did it, and it was real. The approach was really different than Ten of the Square Jar. Ten of the Square Jar was very much like five guys, mm-hmm. inter, like rehearsing and writing songs together. Um, and this was something where I kind of did all the music myself, you know, in a, in a very, very different way. And I presented it to one of the band members, um, and he was, he was not into it. So I, it, it became, you know, and I, I was feeling like it, this was a, an approach or a type of approach. I mean, not that I wanted to do all the music myself, but sort of the aesthetics of that song was felt like something I wanted to pursue. It, it would, I didn't know exactly the time, but I could tell it was something that was going to be lead to something else. I've read you several times talked about how um, you had a conversation with your dad, kind of a heart to heart about music. And uh, he was asking you why you wanted to play music. You know, this is Ibopa era. And you said you wanted to be famous or you wanted, I don't know, you want to be cool or whatever it was. And he was telling you, he was saying that you shouldn't play music for that reason. You should play music to, uh, you know, touch other people. Um, yeah. Where did, does this tie into Shushu or did, was this happening during 10 in the swear jar? This was happening. This was how he told me that before I was in Iboba. Um, oh, really? Yeah. I, I mean, I like just starting to sing and sing in bands. Um, it, it, I mean, it, it completely changed my feeling about music. I mean, realizing that music, the point of music is to come out of it from a place of giving rather than from a place of, of, uh, of self edification, you know, and I don't always succeed at that, but it's certainly the, the goal and in, in trying to play. It really feels like it came to like, came to fruition in the in Shushu though in the early days of Shushu that mission of of what you were how you were playing music and what you were giving in the music yeah do you think it had to do with it being more uh, of a solo thing that you were able to accomplish that oh i mean the early days of Shushu was much more of like a four piece band uh it was you know, like Corey McCulloch, Yvonne Chen and uh, Lauren Andrews and me like in a room writing together no, I, I, it, it was just just a matter of having having a mindset that that came from that place. In 2018, I was reading this thing that said in 2018 that you sent a, a cup of your pee for a raffle for uh, Graveface Records. Oh, it was a jar. <laughs> it was a jar. Okay, <laughs> it's a little more secure to send than just a cup. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like a Dixie cup, like a 
sample from the <laughs> clinic around the corner or something, you know, with like a curry or just carefully holding it in both hands. Balancing it. So the the Greyface Records, I think they got hit from a, a storm or something. Yeah. And this was money for, for their recovery. Yeah, yeah. Um, was this a was this your idea as a way to give back or did they say, hey, <laughs> use some <laughs> some pee to raffle? Uh, I believe it was my idea. Okay. <laughs> I think I had, I had like, this is so dumb. I had, um, been at, do you know, do you, do you guys know what like a white elephant Christmas party thing is? Yes. Sure. Like yeah. this horrible game where it's sort of like a sort of brutal way to give gifts. Anyway, so I got dragged to one of these that I didn't want to go to which would be every white elephant Christmas party, but this one in particular I didn't want to go to. Um, and it was just really far away from where I, I lived at the time. Um, and at that party, I had taken a $10 bill and put it into a jar and filled it with pee. And that was the gift. Um, so <laughs> I think it was, I, I just, it was, I just had jars of pee on my mind at the time, I guess. <laughs> Do you remember how much the pee went for? I don't remember. I do remember thinking it should have gone for more. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say once in a lifetime offer, but I guess that's not true. No, yeah, not true at all. Not true at all. I drink a lot of water, so, you know, I mean, it's I, I could I could crank those out several a day. You're a mega producer is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> well, don't go too heavy on the water cuz if it's too diluted, I think people are going to feel like they're not really getting their money's worth. Oh, that's a good point. That's uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's why it didn't go for as much as I had hoped it would, <laughs> it would have. My my mistake. Now I know. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> that's what we're here for. Let's see. So the 2009, you were doing a solo tour. Uh, so this is a Dear God, I Hate Myself era. Yeah, just before that record came out. Yeah. So you had announced that you were going to be taking photos of everyone at at the shows. Oh yeah, yeah, we did. So you did do that. Yeah. Yeah. How did, how did that work? Did you uh, do it throughout the night or did you line everybody up at the end? It was just at the end. I mean, I don't know if we really got every single person because I mean, it, it required people to wait. I mean, at, at, I've done a lot more solo touring since and they've like the, the turnouts of, and I've gotten better at it just because I've done it more. Um, but I, that was the first solo tour I had ever done. And the shows were very small. So, I mean, it wasn't like, I don't, I don't know if I could, waste that many people's time now but um you know at the time you know there'd be like at the most there'd be like 70 people or something like that and far fewer sometimes so it, it really didn't take all that long <laughs> yeah i went to the cafe du nord show and, and I, I have a picture of myself oh <laughs> um yeah i think i can't remember i think i we had a a blog at the time i think we posted all of them or a lot of them on the blog yeah how was doing that first solo tour? Was that unnerving to be on stage alone? I I don't now. I feel like because I've done it more, I kind of have it together more. But um, I I feel more confident doing it. But I remember it kind of sucking. I did a I did a long European one by myself, all on trains immediately after that one, which was also really difficult. I think I just didn't really know how to do it. I'm not sure, or didn't have. I didn't. I don't think I practiced enough, or 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 something. I, I just I just remember it being really really difficult, um, and people not being that into it probably because it wasn't that great. Do you remember the the solo show you played at Lobot Gallery with uh, Deerhoof? I did a. I don't remember. I think I did a couple times with them. Where is Lobot again? It was in downtown or the, like West Oakland, and I just remember it was like it was an art party. Oh yeah, I lived in Seattle at the time, and I think I drove from Seattle that day. Um, I think I just left at like two in the morning or some, or however you know, whatever time I need to get there to. I remember, I remember falling asleep at that gallery. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember the audience being like, they were. It was like an art party, and so people were like chatting, and you were playing super quiet over on one side of the of this very large warehouse yeah 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 i remember that i remember being so so angry 
it's, you know, I mean, it's like playing at a party is like, I mean, especially it's, I don't know, it's like the, some of the worst gigs I've ever played in my life have been at parties. I just, well, categorically, we won't play them now. Yeah. It's, you know, I mean, people aren't go to a party to play music. I mean, if we, you know, I mean, if we play in like a fucking Aerosmith cover band or something, I mean, then it would be fun <laughs> to play at a party. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> half of the stuff we do is borders on inaudible at times. And it's, it's not, it's not the right music for a party. Speaking of Aerosmith cover bands, uh-huh. <laughs> what about Richard Snake Dick? <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Tell us what Richard Snake Dick is real quick. Uh, Richard's, I don't remember if there were two or one Richard Snake Dick shows. Richard Snake Dick was a sort of, I, I, I didn't really grow up listening to rock and roll particularly. Um, and I like it more now, but um, I just sort of thought it was, sort of butthead asshole music. So I didn't really pay attention to it. So it was, it was like a joke cover band with Corey from Shushu, this guy named two of the people in the bands were, were really, really young at the time. Pete, I can't remember his name, his last name. He's a very good guitar player. And I think it was, uh, Oh, I feel like such a jerk. He's such a sweet guy. He used to play drums and monkey. Um, I'm thinking of, you know what I'm talking about Adam. No. Maybe yeah. he was with a J. The only guy I remember is uh, Cole. I feel like such a jerk. I, I, I know what his name is. He's a, he's a really sweet guy and was a really good drummer, and he played drums. Um, yeah, I think we did like four or five, you know, just I think we did Crazy Train or something, which now every time I do karaoke, I do Crazy Train. Um, but, you know, I mean, it was it was like a joke thing. I, you know, I took off my clothes and I like spray painted my body and stuff like that. And Richard Snake Dick was just sort of the character of the singer. Um, <laughs> It was, it was very silly. It was fun. You were like Daisy Dukes too, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I, you know, and like I, I had, a, I had, a ta- I taught at a preschool at the time and like, I had to like, you know, get, getting spray paint on everybody is hard. So I just had to yeah. wear, I had to wear long sleeve and pants for like a week at this job. So the spray paint didn't show up. It, it, there's no way I could have explained that. When we lived together, I remember walking into the living room and you were coming out of the shower and you still had spray paint all over you. Oh, <laughs> okay. That was when we lived together. All right. And I was like, Jamie, what happened? And you're like, I don't want to talk about it. Like, what there was probably a lot of stuff I didn't want to talk about that happened when we lived together. That was a very, that was a bad time in my life. I mean, yeah, but you were, you were, you were actually a really good roommate. Halfway a good roommate. I mean, I got to say for, for as like, for as insane as you were, like you were a super great roommate. Oh, that's very nice. Of you. Do you remember the time that there was the weird dance party happening upstairs? I don't totally remember. I do remember there being a lot of parties in that place. Yeah. Uh, it was this, there was an exchange student upstairs and I wheeled you into the party in a, in a wheelchair. Oh, right. <laughs> I think I had stolen that wheelchair from another party at some point. Very <laughs> drunk. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. If I was a pain anyway. in the neck, I'm sorry. It was a terrible time in my life. No, I I absolutely enjoyed. I mean, I was I was a pretty terrible roommate myself, but I think you were a great roommate. No, you were great. You were totally nice. Oh, thanks. Oh. <laughs> so Shushu, uh, I think this actually happened. I think Adam was telling me this was you guys lived together right up until about this point. But uh, Shushu got all its gear stolen in like 2003. All right, I'm going to tell you a story. Okay. That is a that is a lie. Oh. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah. Um it it would have been in two thousand yeah, it would have been two thousand three. Um this is the real story. I think I have told the real story at some point. Um I was on tour with two people who were playing really bad. Um and uh we played one show in Missoula and it was terrible and the van I Somebody broke the window of the van we were in, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was on the edge of sanity at that time. And I just, I, I mean, now if somebody broke your van on tour, I would just go, oh, that's fucking shitty. And I would go and get the window fixed. Um, I, it was just between all the other stuff that was happening in my familial and personal life being what was going to be on a very, very long tour with two people. I didn't want to be on tour with Anne who were playing like shit. Um, and then the coming out and finding the window broken, like my brain just, it, it cracked, um, which it still occasionally will do under extreme stress. 
Uh, now that doesn't sound like that much stress. Like that sounds like an, ama- an amount of stress I could handle, but at the time it was not. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, you know, I couldn't really explain to our label and to our booking agent and people who were going to come to the shows and like the 50 promoters who had put shows together. Oh, I just don't have my shit together. I can't fucking handle this right now. I have to <laughs> not go on this tour. So I tried to think of some more plausible, you know, so- something that basically is a good enough excuse to cancel the tour, but not, but but also a good enough a good enough lie that I could conceivably once I got back on my feet resume the business relationships I had with all of these people. Um, it was not you know it was I mean, you know I feel like I can say this that I lied about this because this was fucking twenty years ago. I mean it was not the right way to handle it in any way. Um, but I was completely out of my mind, which is not an excuse. It is just a reason. Um, I think I. I had, I, and I had to tell that lie to a lot of people because, uh, I mean, I had to maintain that lie because I had told it to so many people. So I kept it up for, for several years, but we did not in fact have our gear stolen. I just, <laughs> I made some very, very bad decisions personnel wise. Um, something shitty did happen and the window was broken and my brain was just a pile of unusable mush. You headed home back home after that. What happened to the other two? Did they ride back home with you or did you kick them out? Yeah, yeah. I just I just rode back with them. Um, I can't even totally remember how I convinced them. I think they were, they had, they had even, I mean, I was really living in Seattle then and I was super broke. They had even less, the two guys in the, who were playing had even less money than me. I think one of them was living in his car. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, the prospect of me saying, I have no idea how we can have enough money to fix this window. It seemed not implausible to them either. I think they were also, I think, I mean, their brains were not as melted as mine, but their, the precarity of their life was even uh, more acute than, than mine was at the time. So uh, neither of them were happy about it. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that. And one of them, as he was driving my van home to pull up in the driveway, I think purposely ran it into a rock and he ended up bending the axle. Um, I mean, I can't, I can't, I can't blame him. He and I are actually friends now <laughs> <And> <laughs> we've worked together several times. <laughs> um, he's, he's become a, an incredibly accomplished musician, but at, at the time, what about the other guy? Uh, I don't know. Really happened. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know who they are and I'm not going to say, but. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I mean, they, they slept on, they slept on the futon in our living room for like two weeks before that tour. Oh fuck. Right. You totally did know them. I forgot. Yeah. Yeah. You, you absolutely did know them. Yeah. Yeah. But whatever, fuck them. Um, but this 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 was after I I didn't live in Oakland anymore. But they, that's right, I forgot they did stay in that apartment for yeah. a while. And we used the Dessa rehearsal studio to practice for a tour. We, I mean, a show we played opening for Rasputina at Slim's. So thanks, Dessa. No problem. <laughs> I think you also did some practice in your. I think you also did some practice in your in your bedroom because we shared that thin wall, and I remember coming home to you guys practicing. Sorry. <laughs> no, it was great. <laughs> oh. So this was, so you moved out uh, re- literally right around this time then, uh, like just a little uh, before that tour. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been just, just, be- just before that. Yeah. And then resettled in Seattle and then did the tour. Yeah. Um, did they understand why you were canceling the tour or were you sort of ex- trying to ex- explain to them that? Oh, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't say to them like, I can't fucking handle life and I don't want to play with you guys. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Cause you're playing shitty, you know? Um, no, I don't know. I don't know how I convinced them really. I mean, now that I say it, it seems completely preposterous, which it was, but you know, I mean, not to continue to hammer this point home, but life was much more preposterous at the time. than it is now. I mean, touring is really stressful. And if like things don't line up and if you're not, if you're not, you know, okay with the people you're with and you're not okay with what you're doing things can get real stressful real fast oh yeah yeah i mean i've i've had some horrible horrible lineup situations and just things go very very badly many many times unfortunately i mean at least you pick the most legitimate reason to cancel a tour (laughs) it seems and you know i mean (laughs) again i'm very sorry for having told this lie to anybody that i told this lie to which was a lot of people many of whom i'm still i still work with it only would have been bad if you had done like a gofundme or something yeah i mean at at one point our 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 label head at the time did offer to do like a fundraising thing and i was just like oh no, no no you don't need to do that we'll figure it out 
Um, so, I'm <laughs> um, I mean, and I'll, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. It, it was, it was a mess. It was a mess. And I handled it poorly. So you, one thing I find interesting about your history is that you've been working with a digital recording, like from day one, right? Yeah. Even, even before, even before Shushu. Yeah. So like even, yeah, Ibopa days. Even, even before that. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just because my dad just swiped stuff from work. Cause he, he was, he was working at a place, the place that it kind of invented it essentially. Yeah. So, um, I feel like mid, mid two thousands maybe was when it started to become more normal for musicians to use digital. Okay. So you're at least a decade ahead of people with that. Yeah, I think I was using stuff in as early as, gosh, like 1993, probably this this program called Session Eight, which was all, which was like pre Pro Tools by Digital, but still by Digital Design, which was before Avid. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, super early. I had a, I had a four track before that, and then uh, started using Session Eight. Yeah, you went straight from tape four track to digital recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it was it was exciting. I mean it. Uh, I mean, the, a funny thing is, I mean, I had the the disk drive that I had was a, a two gig disk drive that was took up three rack spaces. I mean, that's how like uh, primitive it was. So, um, but it re- it really shaped songwriting initially, um, in so far as like you know being able to move things around or being able to repeat things. Um, I mean, the, the session eight program was in, incredibly basic. I mean, you could, you could move files around. I think you could have like four EQ plugins total. I mean, not like four types, but like four iterations of an EQ plugin. Um, and that was kind of it. You couldn't automate anything. I mean, you could like mute, it was basically like using like a, a very super basic mixer, but except that you could move the sound files around. So yeah, uh, it, it, I, I think it, it led it led to a different type of uh, creativity uh, as far as shaping sounds and and sort of, and arranging songs. Um, I mean, now I'm in, entirely dependent on digital recording. Um, it's a it's a huge part of uh, how we. Uh, I mean, you know, as it is for a lot of people, obviously, but I mean, just the the platform itself is is a. Uh, I I think I grew up using it as a creative tool and still consider it. A creative tool, not just necessarily something to uh, to record and edit on. Was there ever a time where you went backwards to not use digital stuff, maybe out of curiosity? I never could really like afford tape, so no, I've I've always used it. I mean, I've re- I mean, I've had stuff like mastered to tape or mixed to tape a few times, um, and I have used like cassette players for effects. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever recorded. Oh no, that's not true. Uh, even before this, I did record to tape once or twice in uh, in some studios. But yeah, uh, but yeah, very 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 infrequently, and and not not since I got serious about music. Did you feel like you were watching this technology evolve quickly as you were using it? I wasn't really thinking about that kind of stuff at all. I mean, I was just just trying to make records and just glad I had something to make records on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, I mean, I, I used, I mean, I used any setup I had, I used it into the ground. Um, I, you know, I mean, I still don't hook any pro tools setup I have up to the internet just so I don't have to deal with any updates or yeah. I mean, I think I, I just, I try to just use it as like a, it's dedicated own thing and just use it to make records on and not really pay attention to how technology evolves. I'm super bad at computers. So, um, it's frustrating and also super boring for me. I mean, I, I like being able to use Pro Tools a whole lot, but um, technology as a as a thing is not all that interesting to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember the the rig you were using for a Promise was like stripped down to like the bare components and was being kept in a shoebox. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like just trying to salvage it just to get the the music off of it before it completely died. Yeah, 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 we, yeah, it, yeah, definitely. Um, I think every, I think we have had like f- how many four rigs since we started, and uh, each one it's kind of been the same. Just like <laughs> mixing a record and going, "Oh, this is gonna fucking die in twenty minutes. We got to hurry up and finish this." And then when the record's done, you know, 
get one that's not 10 years old at this point. <laughs> so when you were when you were a kid, one of the first things you ever recorded was uh, yourself saying Fred Flintstone's luscious dick. <laughs> there was I had a friend. My parents got me a, uh, uh, a a stereo that had a little microphone input, and my dad gave me this little cheap microphone. And I had this friend named Gavin Crump. And we were just like doing like Cheech and Chong style. I think I was in the third grade, you know, just like making guitar sounds and I'd be like, dun, 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 you know, and like making drum sounds and stuff and then just saying crazy lyrics. And at one point, um, you know, I just, we weren't even thinking about what you we were saying. I said, Fred Flintstone's luscious dick. And then, you know, we were little boys and like both of us stopped and realized that it wasn't something that either of us would say. Or should say, but later that night, Gavin Crump <laughs> did grab my arm, pull me close to him, and then say, oh, I forgot you weren't a girl, and then push me away. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if Fred Flintstone's luscious dick inspired him or something. You, uh, you, you didn't record anything for a while after that? After I was in the third grade and said Fred Flintstone's luscious dick? <laughs> Yeah. No, I don't think I. I don't remember. <laughs> Probably, I was too afraid of what would come out. Yeah. <laughs> it kind of brings us back to the. You recorded all these ska and punk bands, but you had access to all this digital recording. I don't know if that was something that was unique to their experience at the time, because I'm thinking what 2000. That still might be a little early before it's readily available. Yeah, most most of the people who had any idea about that stuff did seem to be either incredibly irritated because, um, it, you know, I mean, it was just like I had, I had like a little shitty like eight channel Soundcraft mixer to plug stuff into the A to D converter. But I didn't have like a board or any outboard effects or anything like that. And they didn't really understand that a lot of the effects were in the computer. And they just saw the little Soundcraft board. And they're like, what the fuck is this? How are we supposed to make a record here? Um, or they thought it was interesting that it was all on the computer. Um, uh, or there were like 15 high school kids who had drinking like 25 Mountain Dews or something like that and had no <laughs> idea what was going on. So, <laughs> But the, the aforementioned Deerhoof came over and recorded a couple times and they, they seemed pretty interested in it. And then I think went and figured out a way to wrangle a setup for themselves not long after that. Oh, you recorded, uh, you recorded Deer, Deerhoof? No, I don't think everything, anything made it on a record, but we did something that was for like a little soundtrack or something. Um, and then I tried to help them kind of master some record of theirs. Um, maybe, maybe they might have used little parts of it, but I, I didn't work like formally on any completed record of theirs or anything. Like that. Yeah. So you, you were friends with Deer who's pretty early. Um... Yeah. Yeah. We've been friends since gosh, 1999, you know, a long time. So when you were doing Ibopa and you were living in the South Bay, San Francisco bands were too cool for school and definitely considered San Jose. Yeah, it's funny. I, yeah, there, it was a, there was a real divide for sure between San Jose and San Francisco at the time. Yeah. I mean, San Francisco was about as cool as you can get and San, San Jose was about as uncool as you could possibly be. At the time, yeah. Yeah, at yeah. the time, yeah, in the Bay Area. Um, but Deerhoof were a band that were not did not treat you that way. They were one of the, one of the few bands from San Francisco that were not acting too cool for you. Yeah, they were, they were always really nice to us. Um, from the start, Greg is the drummer is one of my, my closest friends. Um, and has worked, worked on Chusha records since gosh, he plays, he played on the first record and has had something to do something either incredibly significant or, uh, to, uh, just a little bit here and there on almost every record we've done since then. Um, yeah, uh, I think a friend of mine, oh, Mia Osaki, we mentioned her. She worked with Mike. Mike yeah. Mike. Um, she gave me a cassette of a record of theirs called Holy Pause. And I listened to it and I had never, this was bef- this was this was when I was playing in a band called Ten in the Swear Jar, which was between Ibopa and Shushu. And I had I had uh, never heard anything like it before. And it uh, really kind of made Shushu possible. Um we, I don't. I don't think we ever really sounded like them, but it, like doing stuff that had a lot of dissonance and noise in it, but that also had melodies in it, which is what their earlier records were like. That it was a major inspiration for us. Um, and then I just, uh, I mean, they weren't doing a whole lot better than we were. I mean, they had they were on Kill Rock Stars, which was cool, but they, they weren't, you know, playing any significant amount of shows. So uh, I just wrote them and asked them if they wanted to play with us at Cafe du Nord. Um, 
and uh, they said yes. And you know, we were we just like basically continually pestered them for shows, um, <laughs> and we you know we would get them shows in the South Bay, uh, you know, or uh, you know around there, which is not where they would normally play, you know. And it was it was at kind of the beginning of them wanting you know them doing shows that they wanted to play, you know, they would play anywhere as would you know any band at the time. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're, I mean, we were, we were huge dorks and they were huge dorks. They just happened to live in San Francisco and happened to be incredibly good, but they weren't, they weren't like cool. You know, I mean, they were a bunch of cool bands, but they're all just huge music nerds. Yeah. Um, and I think because we were dorks and they were dorks, but <laughs> dorks obsessed with music and trying to do something, you know, it, trying to you know, make it work any way we possibly could. We, we, uh, we got along, but they, they've been extraordinarily supportive to us and, um, uh, got us our, our first uh, record deal. Actually, we would be, be nowhere without them. Yeah. I always loved the way it was like noisy, but kind of like seemed like they incorporated lullaby style melodies into that as well. Yeah. 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 So there was always like a childlike element to it, but also this, this dissonant kind of edge to it mixed together. They're, uh, they're a, it's a fascinating construct. All right. So I'm just going to throw an obscure one I found on you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Unlike those other ones, this stick. one's obscure. This is so obscure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, hottest show Shushu ever played St. Louis in St. Louis at the neighborhood arts center in 2005. Oh, the, the, the lamp lamp art center. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. You would remember that. I mean, that any that that would have been documented at all. But <laughs> yeah, I remember that really well. I almost died. I thought. I mean, it was it was rough. So that was in, in an interview in 2006. You said it was your hottest show ever. Does it still stand as your hottest show ever? Oh yeah, and I yeah, um, nothing has come close. Okay. I think what <laughs> this is so dumb. Um, well, we did two shows that same day, and it was it was in the summer uh, in Missouri. Uh, on uh, both, I mean, not a big room, but both shows were sold out. So it was really super packed with people, um, extraordinarily humid. Um, and I've always had bad throat problems. And now I have kind of figured out ways to deal with it. But at the time I was kind of trying anything and I had heard that gargling salt water was a good idea. So what I was also, in addition to gargling salt water on stage, I was just drinking the salt water I had. Oof. So if you're super hot and it's really humid and you're playing, a, you know, like we're playing like as hard as we can for like, you know, we played an hour at a 10 minute break while they brought people in and out and then immediately played an hour again. The room did not cool down in any way. And then raising your blood pressure significantly by fucking drinking salt water. Um, that is a, that's another reason why uh, it was the hottest show I ever played because, you know, and I, uh, I think I almost I probably almost had a stroke or a heart attack or something. Um, yeah, that was, that was very dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and it, while I was sitting on the curb, like outside, like panting with Corey McCulloch, patting my back, making sure I wasn't going to go unconscious. <laughs> I, I kind of put two and two together. and was like, Oh yeah. Salt water raises your blood pressure. <laughs> Fortunately didn't do it again. Yeah. The things you learn on tour. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. If you want to hear the rest of this conversation, head over to our Patreon. Thank you for listening to In Defense of Scott. Please rate and review this podcast and tell a friend. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at In Defense of Scott. Pick up Aaron's book, In Defense of Ska, at your local bookstore or online. This podcast is edited by Chris Reeves of Ska Punk International. This is your co-host, Adam Davis of Omnigon, leaving you by saying Ska now more than ever. Do you love me, Jamie Stewart? Nice. I, I, Man, oh, that's is that you, fun. Adam? Or uh, I know that sounds like I just sampled a Shushu song, but that's actually just me. Wow. How excited were you to have Jamie on the podcast? Pretty excited. I especially liked when we logged in and Jamie didn't realize it was our podcast. <laughs>
That was my favorite part. And I was like, Jamie, it's your old roommate. Hey, speaking, speaking of, of being yeah. Jamie's old roommate, head over behind the curtain. I'm going to go tell you a whole bunch of stories about when I lived with Jamie Stewart. Yeah. So if you want to hear those, head over to the Patreon. We've got different tiers set up there. We've got special prizes for you. Ooh. And you should head over and hear these stories. Some of them All get kind of crazy. Yeah. Every tier will let, allow you to listen to the, the behind. Any the tier. Curtain. But yeah. ha- sign up for the most expensive one, please. Yes, please. Ask your mom for the money. <sighs> Ask your dad. I know you haven't seen him since he went out for milk. But hey, listen. Who do we have next week, Aaron? Oh, next week we have Bailey Lupo from the acclaimed hardcore band Scowl. Yes. We've we've known Bailey for a very long time. Very excited to have them on the podcast. They're not somebody that you would expect to have a ska history. But oh, they do. 